Hello, I've, uh, I'm back with another tier video. Uh, as I mentioned before, um, I'd like to try and get some of these out fairly regularly, like a couple between the, the bigger videos. Um, so I, I uh, figured it's about time, um, really. So first off, I like to open these with a bit of a news update. So I've recorded the audio for the next video. The audio as it stands right now is an hour and 20 minutes, which is not going to be the end result. You can take 20 minutes, half an hour off that easy. So I th suspect the end video is probably going to be around an hour, but I'm not entirely sure. Uh, and it could very easily be less than that. Um, I've also done some research and work with this uh, soap um, video iceberg uh, thing that I'm working on. Um, I've got a lot of things on it as it stands. I'm sort of, at some point, I'm going to have to go through them and, and fully organize them into tiers. I've sort of already, I already had a run through of it, but I'm not entirely sure whether it's it's perfect. And I think I need to take another look at it. Um, and every now and then I find something else that I put on there. And I've got some some things I'm really interested about and uh, and really looking forward to talking about so uh, that should be interesting i don't have a, a sort of an idea of when that might be done by it's sort of you know a background project that i'll work on and uh, at some point it'll be done and i'll 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 get it out and, and sorted but uh, i wouldn't hold your breath it's not gonna be anytime soon um but uh for today uh because it's been a little while since I've spoken about Coronation Street, I think I've got uh, one Coronation Street video, um, which isn't which isn't a lot at all uh, compared to like three for EastEnders. Uh, so Coronation Street hasn't really gotten enough attention from me recently. Um, that's changing though. The next video i'm going to be doing after the one i'm i'm doing is is definitely going to be a coronation street one uh then we've already got the 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 um the focus sorted so yeah either way it'll be an interesting one uh but it's definitely going to be coronation street so that's something um so i figured it's about time i start talking about characters individually um so initially i looked at like a uh I think it was the 50 greatest Coronation Street characters, and I was going to do that. Um, but then I thought it's a bit top heavy. Uh, I, you know, this is just, I can, if I play my cards right, I can get a number of character tier lists out uh, and make them videos. Um, but I, I wanted to try and make it so that it wasn't, you know, all the, all the big, popular, important characters in one video. I wanted to try and spread it out a bit. I don't know whether I've managed that. Um, I think I've got a decent enough spread, but uh, we'll we'll have to we'll have to see how it goes. It may come to it that I'm doing the third one of these, and I've got no other big characters to talk about because I've already used them all up. But we will see. Um, so yeah, we've got twenty five characters, various different eras. I've tried to keep it broad. Again, don't know whether I've succeeded, um, but. Yeah, let's uh, let's start with Alma Baldwin. Um, so Alma, I think, is a very popular character, despite not really having that much going on for the most part. Uh, fundamentally, she's like just a really good foil to Mike, uh, just in the sense that he's money grubbing and selfish and a bit of an ass, whereas she's warm and generous and uh, compassionate. And you know they they clash on certain things. I think she's in part a little bit disgusted by some of the things he's willing to do. Um, and he in turn, I think, sees some maybe he's a bit naive, uh, cheats on her constantly. Um, it is when she dies. That's you know that's one of the bigger storylines that she has. Um, I talked about it a bit in the Bet Lynch video I did. That was criticised because I, they really rushed through it. Um, she was diagnosed and then she was dead within like a month or two, I think. Um, now, Coronation Street went out of their way to say that the entire point of that storyline was that she had initially been 
misdiagnosed or she'd left it too long or something like that which you know is fair enough but it it, it stank to a lot of people of a cheap ratings grab which it was frankly um but that's really good stuff as well uh just watching alma sort of come to terms with the fact that she is going to die um there's nothing she can do about it she hasn't got nearly enough time to really make anything of what's left to her um you know she's she's planning on moving away with a, a new partner and he he has no interest whatsoever in watching her waste away so he leaves uh, and it's just her and and audrey and uh, and mike which again that's a great little addition to that storyline as well that uh, mike realizes the error of his ways and um tries to make amends but again there's not really enough time so yeah uh a sort of mixed end to that character but you know there's not really much else to alma aside from the fact that as i say she's a great foil to mike um and just a generally really kind of likable character she's the one who introduces Haley to roy for example so well i can't rank her too highly uh we'll whack her sort of middle ground i think that's fair, fair enough um, I should quickly explain what these mean, probably. I completely forgot about that. Um, so, S tier, top tier, best, F tier, bottom tier, various rungs in the middle. Kind of self-explanatory. I do like to sort of touch on it um, when I do these videos, just so everybody's basically clear what we mean. Um, so, yeah. So, next up we've got Audrey. So Audrey is one of those interesting characters in the sense that she's been in the show since like 1979. So there's a lot of evolution there. It's one of those things which is clearer with a soap like Coronation Street, just because it's been around for so long. Um, you've got all this time where characters do have to change and you can look back and you can see you know, various eras and phases that they went through. Uh, when Audrey was introduced, for example, she was sort of the embarrassing mum to Gail. She was, you know, sort of mutton dressed as lamb, wearing mini skirts, uh, going out all night, and flirting with Gail's friends. Uh, then she she uh, marries Alf and becomes a sort of social climber, uh, Lady Mayoress of Weatherfield. Then she's a politician in her own right. Uh, she's working on the council, and that's probably my least favourite. Audrey era, um, just because you know, then she's really stuck up and really unpleasant. And since then, she's sort of fallen into the more com comedic sort of phase. She's, uh, you know, one of the things with the Platts is that as they get older, they fall decidedly into comedy characters. And it's happened to Gail and it happened to Audrey. Um, I don't know how I feel about that. I think on the whole, I'm kind of fine with it. I like comedic characters. Coronation Street more than any other soap has a great background of comedic characters. Um, sometimes it's enough to, you know, sometimes it's something I really like. Sometimes I, it's, it's not really enough to save a character for me. Um, with Audrey, I, I, because my memories of her are very much around that sort of early 2000s time when she is sort of social climbing and, uh, you know, a bit stuck up and difficult. I don't have a lot of fond feeling for the character, unfortunately. I know she gets better, um, but for me, she's she's D. She's D tier. Um, yeah. So, I made an entire video about Bet Lynch. I think she's bloody great. Uh, she's far and away my favourite soap landlady of all time. Um, just no contest whatsoever. Uh, warm and fun and powerful. Um, I mean, I, I'm i as guilty as anybody of overusing the term icon, uh, but I think Bat Lynch is very much an icon. Uh, the stuff with her and Alec is great. That The uh, evolution from the barmaid to the landlady is great. Two very different sort of personas um you know very clear growth for the character uh her departure is great at least the first one is 
Um, I don't. It's not. You can't really top that. It's. It's sad and uh, it's mournful, but it's it's sort of optimistic as well. Uh, she's she's moving on to the next best thing, but acknowledging that uh, the rovers really was the most important thing in her life. Um, that first return, as I say in the video, just botched to hell. I just conceptually, it's kind of interesting in the sense that. It's sort of the reality of the happily ever after, which I think is an interesting take on things. Having a character return from, you know, after leaving for Passages New, only for it to have not worked out at all, I think is interesting. I don't think Berlich is the right character to do it with. Um, and certainly not when you're advertising her return as, you know, the thing to try and bolster viewing figures. Uh, people have a very strong memory of Bet Lynch as being fun and gregarious and what they got was anything but. I saw one of those articles that, you know, I think it was top top fifty Cory characters or something. They used a picture of her from the uh, the first return and God does she look awful. I mean just really bad hair and makeup. Just it, it has to be deliberate. Um you know and, and the the way Things had changed behind the scenes, didn't help, and you know, she was she's struggling with that. And the media, of course, had blood in the water, and and you know went after her, and just an absolute disaster. Um, really, I, as I say in the video, if she was going to return at all, it should have been more like the second return, where the cast go to her rather than her returning to Weatherfield. I don't think there was much reason for her to go back at all. I think they should have just bumped into her in Brighton and had a couple of episodes like that, which, you know, it's it's better. I don't think she should have returned at all, frankly. Um, honestly, I think there's a good argument to be made that she never should have left. Um, but, you know, if she had to come back, I'd much rather have that second return than the first. Uh, it's an all right ending as well, as I say, but... It it doesn't top that first departure. So, you know, as far as I'm concerned, Bet Lynch isn't just one of my favourite Coronation Street characters, she's one of my favourite soap characters, so far and away top tier there. Now, Blanche is widely viewed as one of the best Coronation Street characters of all time. She is insanely popular. Uh, I rarely hear a word against her. I'm going to make some enemies here. I can't stand her. I, I hate her so much. Um, I, I just hate old people who are like that, who just are rude and love the fact that they can use the fact that they're old as like an excuse. You, know, you can't really say anything back to her because she's just a little old lady, even though she's saying these vile things. Um, I watched some episodes recently uh, shortly after Sarah Louise had Bethany and she's ju she's just awful she's making this this 13 year old girl cry in the street um you know for no reason whatsoever just a vile vile person I hate Blanche with a passion I've seen that clip of her falling down the stairs like 50 times it's great um so I I I fully appreciate I'm in the mon minority on this. I know I'm, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if I got some criticism for it. Um, I know people love Blanche, but I just can't stand her. I hate her so much. <laughs> just every time I see her on screen, I just think, oh, Christ, here we go. Um, I'm sure the actress was a lovely person. It's a great performance. I just don't like the character at all. Um, so, yeah. Sorry to the vast majority of people. Blanche is rock bottom for me. I I I hate her. Um now Scylla Battersby is sort of mixed, really. Um I think it was a good thing for Les as a character, just to have somebody else to play off in a different way that he um than Janice. Uh because Janice, that I mean, that relationship was kind of at the tail end. She was kind of getting fed up with his antics. Um, they're different people as well. 
but I don't. I think Scylla is. Les is the Janus. Les is like Janus to Scylla, if that makes if that makes any sense. The roles have sort of been reversed. He's found himself in a relationship with someone even more outrageous and egregious than he is. Um, and for a start, you know, to start with, he kind of loves that, but she's a nightmare of a human being, and he can't really handle it. But it does sort of mean that. As a character, he gets an opportunity to lean in more to the old neighbour from hell routine that he'd sort of fallen out of. I mean, you sort of look at those old, old episodes and at certain points where you realise Les isn't there's not really much for him to do. Um, there is when he started and there is when Janice leaves and, and you know has the affair with Dennis. That's great. But for the most part, you know, there's big big sort of wastelands of time in there where there's not there's not much focus he's just sort of about and Scylla gives him something to do and Scylla gives him sort of there's a purpose to the character again um and it's you know it's funny enough I haven't really talked about Scylla in, in this analysis I've talked a lot about Les but not really much about Scylla which sort of probably gives you a hint as to how I feel about the character I think you know, funny, I guess. Um, kind of a bit much for me, if I'm really honest. I think while I appreciate that she exists, I think there are times when it doesn't really work for me. Um, I think it was, a, you know, as an addition to the show, she is positive, um, if only because of what she did for Les. But... You know, I don't, I don't watch those old episodes and go, "Oh, goody, Les and Scylla." Um, sometimes I do. That fake wedding of theirs is funny, <laughs> where they quickly, you know, they break into the church, and Les has got a mate to be a vicar, and then they rush everybody out. That's funny, um, but I, I can see why people might not really like Scylla, um, because. Yeah, I mean, any character that's conceived in the same vein as her is going to run the risk of being grating. It's not a particularly likeable character to have a negligent, self-interested mother who who is allowed to boot. Um, so, yeah, better than Blanche, not as, not as good as Audrey. I know people are going to despise me for saying that a Scylla Battersby is... A, is better than Blanche, but I'm not really. I'm just. This is entirely subjective. If you want to take this list and you want to put it on its head and turn it completely the other way, you are more than welcome to do so. Um, I like to think that these tier videos are less really about where I place the, you know, whatever it is I'm talking about, more just the fact I'm. It gives me an opportunity to talk in a little bit of depth about multiple different things. Um, you know, there's 25 characters on this list. Not all of them warrant a video in their own right. Some of them do. A lot of them don't. I may never speak about them ever again. I may never have, if it hadn't been for you know, these tier lists, I may never have talked about them at all. Um, so that, for me, really is the main function. The ranking stuff, that's just a, that's just a format. Really. Um, so, yeah. So next up, we've got Curly. Uh, now, I I am kind of fascinated by Curly, <laughs> and one of the one of the reasons why is that he's sort of my go to example of the fact that the soap is bigger than the character or the actor. Kevin Kennedy was in Coronation Street for twenty years. Um, you know that's a third ish of the of the time that coronation street's been about today but in terms of like a legacy is there much there i don't I, I don't necessarily think so i mean we remember curly fondly but you know he hasn't left as much of an impact as as a lot of other characters but having said that you know it's i don't mean that as a negative um that's just the nature of it i ju i think it's impressive that a a uh, character and actor can be on a show for 20 years anyway and leave no real 
dent in it just because the show is so much bigger and will just keep on rolling. Um, going back to Bette Lynch, I talked about this in, in the video I made about her. I think it must have been a bit weird to see it just keep on going as if you weren't even there. You are no bigger than the show. The show is the star. You're just, you know, a cog in the machine. Um, and that's sort of one of the reasons why Curly sort of sticks out to me because he's sort of a reminder of that. Um, you know, that, that 20 years of service falls into the sort of mists of time. I'm probably not making any sense. I know what I mean. Um, yeah, and I've seen, you know, there's a video about typecasting. I want to, I'm sort of, it's on my list. I need to do a bit more research before I get into you know, possibly doing it. But he's sort of one of my case studies because he says there's a behind the scenes documentary where he talks about, um, you know, how he's thought about this is when he was on the show, when he, he mentions that he's had that sort of thought process himself of, you know, as an actor, he does kind of want to challenge himself, but at the same time, Coronation Street is, you know, it's made him famous and it's also, you know, solid work. He's getting paid for and it's regular and it's a tough old world world out there, even though it's not necessarily the most creatively fulfilling thing ever. Um, so, you know, that's that's really more about the the wider view of you know, what it is to be a soap star and Kevin Kennedy in particular, but that sort of explains why why I think about Curly more than I think many people do. Um, but in terms of the character itself, if I can drag it back to what I'm actually meant to be doing, uh, Curly, he's a, he's a lovable loser. Um, really sums up a lot of Curly Watts. Uh, he, you know, he started as a binman, um, but then he went into what was it? It was it was it wasn't Freshco when it started, was it? Was it Better Buy when it started the, the sort of supermarket? I don't know. But he started there, and then he had his his um his double act with Reg Reg Holdsworth, and that's great because Reg is like the ridiculous one, and Curly's like his somewhat less ridiculous lieutenant, um, and they, and they work quite well together. To be honest, sort of these wannabe titans of industry, um, who are really anything but. The stuff with him and Raquel is great, just very, very sad, very sort of. You know, it's easy to feel sympathy for Curly. He's 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 such a sort of regular guy in many ways. He's such a regular person, and like a lot of other soap characters that sort of fall into the trap of uh, you know getting sort of too much too many really big storylines Kevin or C Curly sort of doesn't um he feels one of those soap characters that feels very much like a real person in a lot of ways um yeah I've seen I think there's a I mean I could probably do a list of like sad um soap character departures but for some reason Curly's always stands out to me um you know where he leaves with his new wife and his new son um and just you know he takes a moment to look around his house just just a little private moment you know, the empty house before he leaves and picks up his telescope which it's lucky he went back in there to be honest that Emma left the telescope, his new wife left the telescope inside, presumably hoping he wouldn't bring it, I guess, because there was no room in the new house. Um, yeah, it's a good thing he found it. But yeah, I I, I often have moments like that when I move house or, or you know, leave for a, a new place. I've moved house a number of times and I've usually had a moment like that where I've just sort of taken in that... Uh, you know, that chapter of my life is over. As I say, he's a very regular, relatable character. Um, less of a know-it-all as things sort of progress. He, when he starts, he's sort of this philosophizing bin man. Um, and then he tries to better himself. And he has, I think, I think it's first, Soap's first you know, interracial relationship, um, which is, you know, 
groundbreaking in and of itself. Uh, but I think he ruins that because he's so obsessed with studying and then he, you know... There's there's lots of little things I like about Curly. He's not he's not one of those characters that really has a lot of heavy, hard hitting storylines. But he's he's there, and he's you know I don't think anybody does anybody hate Curly Watts. Is everybody sort of maybe just shades of fondness all the way down? I don't know. Um, but I I like Curly. So as far as I'm concerned, he's he's probably right up here for me, to be honest. Uh, yeah. So. Now we've got David Platt. So David Platt, I think one of the things that stands out to me when I go back and I watch old episodes, I say old episodes of Coronation Street, they're only about 20 years old, um, is how strong the, the child acting is from, um, I don't know their names, the actors who play David Platt and Sarah Louise Platt. Just, you know, how easy would it have been to just have have child actors in there who weren't that great and ended up getting recast you know the fact that it's still them is a testament to to how solid their performances were for child actors i mean they're not you know breathtakingly brilliant but for child actors they're good um so the fact that they're still in it that is that's that's there's something to be said for that i think um the soaps that it gives actors an 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 opportunity, which was maybe a poison chalice to have a a character like that where they just essentially spend their entire life playing them. Um, and I don't know whether that's a good or a bad thing. I think it's there's definitely shades of both. Um, you can maybe argue it leads more into the 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 bad side of things just because it doesn't necessarily give them an opportunity to to try other things. But uh, Bill Roach, who plays Ken, that's, you know, that is kind of, that has kind of been his life. Um, you know, that that character, which it must be a weird feeling. I know he's spoken about it being a weird feeling, as lots of other long running actors on, on soaps have. Um, it must be interesting as well. And it's really the only genre you can get that, I think. Um, although there are some examples from theatre, but. Yeah, when David Platt started out, he was sort of just like a cheeky kid, and then he turned into Satan, and that was very much the entire point of the character, was that he was a really troubled teen, who was just sort of a nightmare, um, you know, pushed his mum down the stairs, at one point he accidentally gives his niece, little Bethany, LSD, I think she finds it hidden in a doll of hers, um, he trashes the street a few times, just a really difficult kid, um, just sort of a nightmare delinquent. And then he grows up and has kids of his own, and suddenly he's dealing with difficult children, which is such a simple, basic, obvious thing to do. Um, but it works. And I think one of the things that can be added to the, you know, sort of positive side of, of having a character played by the same actor, um, you know, right the way through, is that that evolution sort of works a lot better. You know, it feels very much like here is the same character going through these things rather than here's a character who's been played by three different actors, um, you know, like Ben Mitchell, for example, um, and will just be continually recast every few years until the heat death of the universe. Um, I think it works a lot better if you have the same actor playing that character all the way through. And I, for one, am really interested to see where David ends up in, you know, 20, 30, 40 years. Um, I hope we have that. I hope we have David Platt as an old man on the street. Um, you know, sort of the new Ken, in a way. That would be interesting to me. Although, maybe a bit sad for the actor. I don't know. Maybe he, maybe he wants that too. Who knows? Um, so, yeah, but... <sighs> Having said all that, and all that is is good and interesting and noteworthy, I don't know whether I don't really like David Platt. I think he's a bit of an ass. Um, certainly, you know the the, uh, the storylines and moments that I am most familiar with. Um, it's hard, 
sometimes with such a long running show because I, you know you're going to be more familiar with aspects of a character or storylines than others um david platt is very much that i him being difficult is sort of that is who david platt is to me when i think of david platt i think of david platt trashing the street um you know i don't think of him necessarily as a little kid his was it barney the rabbit i don't know <laughs> can't remember or um you know him nowadays with kids so for my money i i find it difficult this is probably another controversial decision i'm probably not going to win any friends with this I'm, you're all going to unsubscribe and start sending me hate mail uh or maybe you won't care i don't know but yeah that's one of the uh one of the disadvantages of doing tier lists is that as i said it's very very subjective and my opinions may differ greatly when compared with you know, the average person on the street who knows maybe i've inspired people to to be bold and open about their hatred of Blanche. I don't know. So next up, we've got Elsie Tanner. Elsie Tanner is uh, one of the original characters, played, of course, by the brilliantly named Pat Phoenix, which is easily one of my favourite names of all time. Um, Elsie Tanner is sort of... sort of whatever happened to the good time girls, you know? Um, they, it's her entire story is her getting older and dealing with the fact that she's aging, and struggling with what she views as a wasted youth. Um, you know then that she she no longer has neither the energy nor the ability to attract men that she used to. Um, she's feeling her loneliness. She's feeling her age. But of course, she's also really tough. Um, you know, she's one of she's one of those three women who sort of led the street in those in those early years it's her it's Ina and it's uh it's um Annie Walker uh three very different women three very powerful women Coronation Street is a show built on um matriarchs and Elsie Tanner is very much one of them um she's one of my favorite characters too I just think there's something about the performance I think Pat Phoenix it's not just that she's a great actress but she's got that sort of star quality as well um there's a great scene online i think uh i can't remember what it's called but it's the scene where he's it's it's um the morning after a night out and she's gone to a bar somewhere and she's gotten chatting with, with some guy and uh Know, things are, are moving forward and he, he wants to take her up to a room and then it turns out he thinks that she's she's a sex worker and it's a real wake-up call for her and things get ugly and she's asked to leave um and the next morning she's just sort of broken and uh mike baldwin comes looking for her because she's not at work and you know it's just it's her confronting the fact that she's she's getting old and what the hell happened to to my youth and my life? And you know, how the hell did I get here? And how did I make such a bloody mess of everything? And it's such a great scene. Um, you know, Pat Phoenix is easily one of the standout stars of Coronation Street. Um, and, you know, Elsie Tanner is more than just a tough woman who sleeps around a bit. There's a lot of vulnerability there too. Um, that's one of the things I really like in a character. I like I like funny characters, I like complex characters, I like great performances. I think I don't think that's you know, I don't think you're ever gonna find anything anybody who says I don't like funny characters or great performances. Um, you know, there's nothing novel in that. But that's really my metric when I'm judging things like this, and Elsie Tanner is right up there for me, easily. So next up, we've got Ina Sharples. Now, I suppose in a sense, Blanche is kind of a sort of evolutionary descendant of Ina Sharples. One of the things all soaps really, but Coronation Street, I think in particular does, is that it will have sort of its archetypes are very strong. You know, you've got um, the battle axe, you've got the 
Um, they're not on here, but well, they are the uh, the couple who bicker but but love each other really. Um, that's an archetype that comes up really often. Um, and Blanche is it's, it kind of is sort of uh, Ina, um, sort of in a new form. They they're very good at that when they repeat themselves, they do put a spin on it. You know, it's not like these are these are cookie cutter versions of the same characters. They're not. Um, we'll come on to that a, a bit more in just a little bit. Um, but Ina is that first battle axe, um, and I think for start, you don't get women like Ina anymore, uh, which is sort of obvious. It's such, uh, you know, obviously you don't because you know times move on and. And that sort of generation has long since died off. She's she's the last remnant of the Victorian age, really, is Ina Sharples. Um But when you when you sort of hear a, a bit about what the character went through, I mean she she buried a child and a husband and she lost her um you know, I think uh, her boyfriend in, in the First World War or the Second World War and, you know, all that stuff that she's gone through. There is a reason why she's sort of tough. She comes from that generation who did experience the First World War and the Second World War and, and you know, the Great Depression or the, the Great Slump, as it was called in Britain. Um, those were really tough times. And that's the generation that it produced sort of hard, you know, difficult people, rude, brash you know, gutsy people um, who had been through an awful lot. I think one of the key differences between Blanche and Ina, um, firstly, I actually kind of find Ina kind of warm in a way, which I think is a bit weird um, for her and uh, Uncle Albert. Um, there's a scene where they're getting drunk in the Rovers because he snuck in a bottle of brandy on the cheap. Um, you know, little scenes like that, funny. Um, I think one of the key differences is that whereas when Blanche says, you know, something makes a comment to somebody, it's it's designed to hurt and it's mean. Um, when Ina says something, she's just stating facts. The difference between like having a brick wall fall on you and being stabbed multiple times, um, and I would much rather have a brick wall fall on me. So Ina is right up there quite frankly now this is one of those uh, newer characters um, well I say newer, she's been in it for about five years now, but it's Evelyn um, who is Tyrone's nan now this is one of those where I I don't necessarily watch as much of new Coronation Street as, as older Coronation Street. So my first sort of encounter with Evelyn came through the fan community. Uh, I knew she was very, very popular, like almost right off the bat. Um, and I sort of thought, oh, okay, I know what this is. This is this is Blanche 2.0, right? Okay. Um, and certainly, I've seen a lot of comments in that vein. But I, you know, I try and mix and match what sort of Coronation Street I watched. And I watched some more modern Coronation Street not too long ago. And I was really impressed with, with what I found with this character. Um, I don't really like uh, Maureen Lipman too much, just like as a person. Um, but she's a really good actress, especially in the soap sort of scene. She's a standout. You can tell she's had classical training. She, you can tell she's come from that school. So that's obviously one thing that, that counts in this character's favour. But I was also really impressed by the fact that she isn't really that much like Blanche. Um, on a surface level, I, I get the comparison. Um, you know, she's an older woman who's a bit sharp. Okay, I get that. But that's sort of as far as it goes. Um, you can tell with Evelyn that this is somebody who has learned to be sort of tough and sharp and put a, a hard face on. 
rather than somebody who was who was just like that because they enjoyed doing it. You know, this is somebody who has struggled very much, been responsible for trying to get a daughter off heroin, um, and you know that has been the focus of so much of her life, and it's exhausted her, and it's you know it's 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 probably killed a little part of her, frankly. Um, but it makes sense why she is the way she is. And even then, one of the things I noted was that Co the Coronation Street doesn't seem to have a problem making her the butt of the joke. There's a scene where she loses her dog Cerberus and she and Roy Cropper go out looking for it in the wee small hours of the morning. And he falls asleep and, you know, they they get spotted by a police officer who thinks they're dogging. You know, Blanche would never have been in a situation like that. Um, Nine times out of ten, I'm sure it does happen, but nine times out of ten, Blanche is the Blanche her purpose is to make sharp comments. She is not the butt of the joke. She is the one telling the joke. But Evelyn is far more balanced. Um and I really like that. It's a shame that they had to retcon Tyrone's parents. Um you know, the old Tyrone's parents. It happens, it's a little annoying. Um you know, it just it just seems like they've gone back and said, wait, we can do this better. Fair enough, I get it. But, uh, you know, I know some people are annoyed about it. Less so me, really, um, but I understand that. But I don't really understand... Well, I do. I understand why people compare her to Blanche. I think she's better. Um, I think there's a lot more going on there. I think she's more likeable. The jar, the jibes, and the barbs aren't, you know, just a just a mean old woman saying things. Um, you know, she's she's a bit bitter and she can be cruel, but by the same token, she can also be the joke herself. Um, so yeah, I I like her a lot. I'd need to see a bit more of her, really, but I think that's a solid standing for me. Now, this is quite a topical one, uh, because poor old John Savident died not too long ago. Um, I was thinking of him like the day before it happened, just wondering what, what he was doing and, and noting that I hadn't really heard anything from him in a, in a little while. Um, but Fred Elliott was was sort of in the news a lot recently. Um Incidentally, I was incredibly sad and noted a mistake in the BBC article. Um, they mentioned that he had died in uh, the in the wrong person's house. It, it wasn't Audrey's. They said it was... Uh, oh, I can't remember her name. The woman he's going to marry. I'm, yeah, long-time viewers will know I suck at remembering names. Um but yeah, that just a just a fun little thing I noticed that I I didn't complain about because I thought it would be petty. Uh, but Fred Elliott was was experienced a joyous little resurgence in popularity, and people were talking about him and and remembering him, and uh, you know posting clips. There were lots of new clips posted on YouTube, which I very much appreciated. Um, unlike Blanche, I'm I'm right along with the Monara my jar. Yeah right along with the majority for this one. Fred Elliott is easily one of my favourite characters of all time. Um, it's sort of surprising, because I can imagine there's people who hate him, because I, I get that, because he is... For a start, there's no subtlety with Fred Elliott. He's big, he is loud, he's over the top, he is a ridiculous human being. I love that. I know a lot of other people love that. It's a great comedic performance, but I could absolutely imagine some people just rolling their eyes every time he's on screen. Um, it's probably a minority, but I bet they exist. So if you hate Fred Elliott, please let me know, because I think it would be interesting to at least know you exist and confirm that little theory. Um, so, well, I think it's it does the character a little bit of a disservice to say that he's just a comedic character. He's obviously a brilliant comedic character. That's that's certainly what he's best known for. Certainly where he operates best. But there's a bit more to him. Um, you know that that short storyline where he reveals to Ashley that he's his father. 
There's some great acting in that, where he tells him how proud of him he is and how difficult it was not saying anything sooner. Um, there's the uh, the recurring troubles he has with women. Um, I'm sort of glad they don't mention the fact that that basically he's he's kind of a pervert in the, <laughs> at least he's mentioned to be. You know, Ashley says that women have been avoiding his shop because he keeps, you know, rubbing up against them accidentally. Um, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm sort of glad that wasn't mentioned since there wasn't a storyline where like he got a bit handsy with somebody. I sort of wish they hadn't said it at all. <laughs> um, I like the fact that he is awkward around women and a bit and sort of loud and off-putting, but I don't like envisioning him as, you know touching him up in that way um yeah but there's uh you know the uh the stuff with um his uh his orchid his Thai bride um that he you know is conned into believing as a Thai bride he actually just works on the market that's really sad um you know again great performance but Fred Elliott is exactly the sort of person who would fall for that He's exactly the sort of person who would, you know, fly over to Thailand and marry a Thai woman and get divorced and then marry another one immediately afterwards. Um, it's it's sad that he dies on his wedding day before he, he gets what he really wants, which is a you know, a wife again. Um, and that, 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 you know, as I was saying with Curly, if I had a list of sad character departures, he'd be on it. Um, you know, I I find that last scene with Audrey really touching. It's it's clearing the air. It's them parting on on good terms. Um, you know, it's 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 sad. Um, it's it's a sweet scene though. Um, and it's a, it's a good ending to a to a really brilliantly funny character and just spectacular comedic performance by John Savadon. Um, you know all those all, all those weird noises that he that he makes all those all those sort of looks uh, that face which is great for for comedy the pompousness of it um or the pomposity of it all and you know i i watched recently there was a um compilation i think it was the fresh co training day uh, where he he thinks he's going to a golf club and it's one of those you know SAS style training things where they have to go on you know eight mile marches in the middle of the night um he basically just refuses um the the, the sinkhole he falls into um you know him screaming at the budgie and then again at the baby <laughs> The fresh co the fresh co siege, where he complains that he's starving, and you know talks the the hostages into letting him start a barbecue, <laughs> just far and away one of, if not the greatest comedic character, certainly Corey's ever had, probably all a soap, quite frankly. So as far as I'm concerned, that's another S tier for me. So I'm gonna do. Um, Stan and Hilda together because really that's where they're at the strongest. I mean, a lot of the reason why Gene Alexander left was because Bernard Ewens had, had died um, and she was well aware that her character strength lay in the fact that it was a double act. So, as I was saying before with Evelyn and, and Blanche, Coronation Street does have a tendency to repeat its archetypes. Um, and Hilda and Stan are very much that couple that that act like they, you know, they're always at each other's throats. You know, he's a layabout, she's a shrew, but deep down they love each other, and sort of you couldn't imagine one without the other. Um, I think they're pro they are probably the best example of that. I know some people really like uh, Jack and Vera. I do too. I think Stan and Hilda sort of have them. You know, it just just by a nose, I think, win it. Um, I think the reason for that is that there are times 
early in Jack and Vera's characters' lives when you can, it's hard to sort of see that they genuinely do love each other. They cheat on each other constantly. You know, at, at one point Vera collapses into his arms and cries because she, he doesn't tell her that he loves her. Um, I think the strength of those characters is that you do have to believe that deep down they do love each other. I think Coronation Street became aware of the fact that it was becoming harder and harder sometimes with Jack and Vera. They turned that around um, and, you know, by the end of it, they were clearly very much still in love with each other. Um, two more really sad character departures in Stelly. Not a great character departures here, but anyway... For my money, Hilda and Stan are better than, than Jack and Vera. Um, I mean, Jean Alexander is clearly somebody who cares very much about her craft. Uh, you know, very focused on getting it right. Very much a professional. Her departure is a testament to that. Um, that, was, that wasn't just the nation giving Hilda a fond farewell. It was also the cast and crew genuinely sad to see Jean Alexander go. Uh, she's called it her, her reward for good behaviour which I think is a good way of looking at it. Um, it. Time was, Hilda Ogden was like the most famous, certainly the most famous person on, on TV, but one of the most famous in the country. There was a poll in the early 80s uh, of the most recognisable women in Britain, and the top four were the Queen, Princess Diana, the Queen Mother, and Hilda Ogden. So Hilda Ogden was more recognisable than Margaret Thatcher, which I think is very, very interesting and cool, frankly. Um, it, Hilda's sort of, with her rollers in her hair and a terrible singing voice, just, it's very easy to see why she is an icon. Her and a muriel, that's great. Um, just Annie Walker's continual sort of disgust with her. Um, this tiny little woman who always wanted more, uh, you know, was very proud of the fact that she had owned, she owned her house. She was the only person on the street to own her house. Everybody else was renting, um, but she owned it outright. She always wanted to sort of advance herself more um, in social circles, but she was never going to be able to. Um, and her and Stan, great double act. Stan Ogden is the greatest layabout in TV history. There's no comparison in my mind he's such he just looks so done with it all he cannot be bothered to do a thing all he wants to do is sit in the rovers and drink um you know he is spectacularly lazy there's there's just no question that this is a man who 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 has no desire to do any work whatsoever and frankly would much rather just be left alone um that i think the moment where they meet, um, we're told that they meet in in it's during a blackout, uh, and Hilda's making her way to the the air raid shelter, and she trips over Stan and he's drunk in the street. If that's not the best sort of that doesn't sum up who these two characters are. That introduction, then nothing really does, um, because Stan is constantly tripping Hilda up in some way or another. She spent her entire married life tripping over his shiftless body. Um, but there's still so much affection there, <laughs> despite it all, that you can't imagine one without the other, really, um, despite the fact that they clearly get on each other's nerves. Um, you know, the, there was no question that Hilda would ever remarry after Stan died. Um, of course, she wasn't going to. Um, loads of great... Little scenes as well, that, you know, woman, Stanley, woman, that's amazing. <laughs> I love that so much, just that one line, I think everybody does. Um, their relationship with Eddie Yeats, sort of, I mean, it's very much a Jack and Vera Tyrone situation, isn't it? Um, I think Coronation Street just, just lifted that and tried to replicate it, but again, put a different take on it. I don't begrudge them doing that because they always do something a little different with it. It's not just the same characters, same relationship every single time. Um, so, yeah, I think, honestly, if pressed, I might prefer Stan to Hilda just a little bit. I know that might be sacrilege, but 
I just find there's something so likable in in really lazy characters, <laughs> and Stan just has zero interest in anything. Uh, you know, just constantly skiving off work, just constantly sitting at the bar of the Rovers, drinking his pint, and wants to be left alone. And God bless him for it. So, um, yeah, yeah. Let's let's put him in eight here. I think they're worth it. Now, Karen McDonald is a character that still pops up in conversation from time to time. I think she's more interesting than a lot of people give her credit for, quite frankly. Um, Karen is, I think, this, is she the second? It's so hard to keep track. I think she's the second wife of Steve McDonald. They get married for a bet, and then it's sort of a, they sort of fall into, they sort of fall in, into a sort of love with one another. Um but it's sort of difficult with Karen because I don't know whether she ever really did love Steve in any sort of conventional sense. I think she thought she loved Steve, but I think she loved maybe the idea of a of that sort of relationship in her mind more. You know, maybe she loved that Steve loved her more than she actually loved Steve himself. I don't know. Certainly not a healthy relationship. Um, I think just. Just a nightmare of a person. Just awful. Just selfish and materialistic and vain and bullying and awful, awful person. Um, great to watch, in a sense. Because, you know, again, I think maybe you could add them to the list of characters inspired, in a sense, by Stan and Hilda. Um, but they take it a, a different way they take it in a far more toxic route um saran jones's performance is great i'm really glad she's gone on to to other things one of the few who's managed it um so you know great there but i think where it gets really interesting for karen is that that storyline with tracy and and you know baby amy she's kind of got a point you know she's she kind of has a right to be annoyed that her husband, during like a pause in their relationship, has a has a child with another woman, and now she's sort of pushed to the wayside as he sort of gets closer with Tracy, and you know his mother clearly prefers her to to Karen, and you know she's sort of losing that, and then she tries to have a baby on her own, thinking that that'll fix it, which of course it never does, but she can't do it, and that's a lot of stress for her, and. She, you know, she ends up not kidnapping Amy, but, you know, the situation makes it look like she's killed her. And Steve is obviously outraged by this. But I think, I think she's kind of got a point. It's a really horrible position to, to be in. Um, you know, it's, I think one of the things I really like about that storyline is that nobody's really massively in the wrong they do terrible things but they're not you can you can understand where everybody is coming from and like steve wants to be in his daughter's life and that means being around tracy but by the same merit you know karen feels like her husband is being stolen from her and she doesn't like that in the conventional sense georgia doesn't like it because you know she's in a uh control freak and a and an attention seeker. She doesn't like being undercut by another woman. Um so I think there's more to Karen than just a you know, a materialistic, nasty person. Um so yeah, I I despite the fact I don't really I don't think she's a likable character, I think she is an interesting one. Um and they do interesting stuff with her. And I'm glad Saran Jones has gone on to bigger and better things. So I'm going to stick her right there. Little Mavis. Um, what a fun character. Like, her and, and Rita, who we're going to talk about in a bit, their relationship, that's a great doll act. Like, Rita's very much the straight woman, and Mavis is sort of the neurotic, sort of fidgety, weird one. I guess um, weird probably isn't the right word, but you know she's a little. She's definitely the odd one of the two, um, but 
you know, a very likable character and a great performance, a great fun performance. And that double act is a really, really strong one. And I think, I'm sure I'm not alone in thinking that we just sort of went a bit downhill after Mavis left. Certainly that was, that was probably the strongest period for the character, I, I think you can say. Um, you know, that, that stuff with Mavis and, and Mavis and Derek, another just great couple. Um, just two, two characters who were sort of ridiculous in their own ways but quite happy to be ridiculous in their own ways. Um, that double jilting is is very them, that they both just have too much anxiety about that moment for various reasons, and they can't go through with it, and they both end up jilting each other and are just as outraged at each other. <laughs> at each other. Like, no, I was jilting you. You don't get to jilt me. Um, so, yeah, I haven't got too much to say about Mavis, really, but... She is a likable character, um, and you know, I'm sad to see her go. I don't think she'll ever come back, um, and but I do think you know, for the time that she was there, she was a really positive addition. I think, as I say, she did really great things for Rita's character. Her and Derek are great. So uh, I am going to put her. I'm going to put her here as well. Now, Mike Baldwin. He's sort of, I don't know, is there anything really likeable about Mike Baldwin? Maybe a bit. I mean, the stuff with him, as I said before, when Alma's dying, um, that's a great new vulnerable sign to that character. Uh, and it, it does, you do feel for him because he's wasted an awful lot of time. And, you know, he, I think he, he does realise that at the end. Is it real? Though, is it maybe him, you know, if he sat down and he thought about it, if Alma wasn't dying, would he want to get back with her? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Um, certainly the stress and, and the horror of the situation exacerbates any feelings that he has. Um, in terms of the character himself, sort of a greedy, shyster of a man, sort of person who, you know, would fleece you out of a deal you know he he has no compunctions about doing that he's not a con man necessarily but he's he's no problems whatsoever about being ruthless in business um a good addition to coronation street more of sort of a southern type of person um compared with you know a field of northerners Great contrast with Ken Barlow, like just completely different people, completely different views of the world. Ken is very moral and upstanding and believes in sort of bigger things like, you know, uh, morality and decency and, uh, you know, has a social conscience. Ken Barlow has none of that. Or Mike Baldwin has none of that. Mike Baldwin is, is materialistic and is looking to better himself. Um... You know, it's a dog eat dog world, whereas Ken believes that you know it's more of a a socialist view of things. Mike, not a chance. Very much an individualist at heart. Um, and of course, you've got the Ken Mike Deirdre love affair, which again is just really really solid television. It's not one of my favourite um, soap storylines, but. Those are the, really the characters you want involved in it. Um, two men just polar opposites to each other who despise each other even before the the Deirdre stuff uh, kicks off. Um, so, yeah, I haven't really got much else to say about Mike. I suppose I like the way they do with his departure in a sense. Um, you know, I think the Alzheimer's thing, I mean, Alzheimer's is inherently tragic. You know, you're forgetting who you are. You're losing that part of yourself. You sort of watch a person, in a way, die before your eyes. Um, in fiction, it, it helps to give it to somebody who was sort of larger than life. Um, and in a sense, Mike Baldwin sort of was. It's sad to, to see someone who was powerful and an individualist become very, very vulnerable. Um, the only thing I will say is that I don't, 
that final scene, I don't think the acting's very good in that. To be honest, it doesn't really work for me, although there is obviously a, a lovely bit of irony that he dies in the arms of his old of rival still boasting about how you know he's he's gonna steal De- Deirdre away and he's won. Um so a great character, but is that it's not really the sort of, of character that really stays with me personally. Um but there are there are things to talk about and there are good things about him, but no, not a personal favourite. Now Norris is sort of one of those characters I I sort of like him and I don't, which maybe we, the the view a lot of people have. He's an an annoying little man, um, but that's the entire point of the character. He's meant to be. He's he's your nosy neighbor. He's your judgmental neighbor. He's the guy who's always got an opinion about everything and won't you know leave well enough alone, um, and sort of needs smacking down. To to quote Ben Mitchell, but um, yeah, I. Another great double act with Rita. Um, you know, again, she is the straight woman. He's the annoying one, um, and he is annoying. Like you, you do sort of wish he'd get a smack from time to time, um, but he is fun to watch. Fun to watch in that regard. I'm fine with annoying characters as long as they're fun. That is the golden rule of fiction. You know, do I enjoy spending time with this person? Um, I do, you know, despite the fact he's a pain in the arse. He's meant to be, and it's done in a funny way, and the joke is on him. Again, it's not like Blanche where, you know, the joke is on other people a lot of the time, and she's just the one saying it how it is. The joke is very much on Norris. We are meant to laugh at him and his ridiculous antics. Um, So, yeah, Norris... It's not difficult for me to say, really, because I am... Yeah, go on. I, you know, as annoying as as he is, he is fun to watch. Um, you know, there's a reason why he's such a popular character, or was such a popular character. So, moving on, we've got Raquel. Now, poor sweet Raquel. He's just a very naive person, but a very likable character as well. Just sort of very. There's something about her that just you you feel very protective towards her. Um, you sort of want to make sure everything's okay and and look after her. She's got big dreams, but you know she's she's struggling to make them happen. And she's working as a barmaid, and she's unlucky in love, and she just needs the right person. And then she ends up with Curly, and and that doesn't really pan out too well. Um, you know, all the stuff with Des Barnes, and he's constantly cheating on her, but she she. You know, still, still wants to be with him, even though she definitely shouldn't. Um, there's, there's probably something in that, to be honest. That sort of, it's a really good take on the whole. You know, all you need is a nice guy sort of thing. Like Curly is a nice guy, um, and Des is not a nice guy necessarily. He's cheating on her a lot. Um, but it was never going to work with Curly, really, was it? Uh, they were just very different people with with sort of different takes on what they wanted. Uh, Curly was reasonably happy enough where he is, but I think Raquel's ambitions far outstripped his. Um, you know, that scene, it's been talked about a bit, that last scene. It's not her last scene, but the scene where she leaves Curly and walks down the alleyway. You know, and the moonlight reflected in the puddle. That's a great scene. Um, you know, she comes back and tells Curly that he has a daughter a few years later. Not a great thing to do, I think. I think um, Maybe should have told him that previously. Um, you know, she's she's living in, in France now and probably having a great time. But while, she just, while she was on Coronation Street, she, she was just one of those characters where you do feel very protective of her. Um, you know, she's this vulnerable person, this this little innocent, this little innocent who, who you know, because she's a, the fact that she's attractive sort of makes her even more vulnerable, really. Um, 
Is that the famous scene where she and Ken, she, he's teaching her French, and she says that she knows the French for, um, you know, isn't it a lovely day or something like that? And it's somebody, it's some Frenchman who's come up with her and, and offered to take her to bed. Um, it probably happens a lot, frankly, and she just she just never knows. Bless her. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's really the thing that stands out to me about Raquel. Likeable, good person, innocent, and, and sort of vulnerable, but not in a patronising way, really. Um, you know, she's just the sort of person who, who when she gets hurt, it, it has far more of an impact than it might do with, you know, a lot of other characters. Um, and just fun to watch as well, funny in her own right. I think maybe, I think I know um, another actress who's, who's moved on to the bigger and brighter things, but she's, I can't remember, what's the actress's name? I don't know, I can't remember. Um, she said that uh, that she felt that the, they were maybe making her too much of a joke towards the end. Um, and yeah, I would I would appreciate that. I I think that's a character you don't really want to make her sort of a blonde dummy. Um, there's a lot more to her than that. She isn't a blonde dummy. She's just she's just vulnerable. Um, and, uh, yeah. So. Yeah, I'm I'm gonna put her right up here. So next up we have uh the greatest villain in soap history, and yes, I will fight you on that. Uh Richard Hillman. Um so yeah, I I can definitely do a video about Richard Hillman. I've spoken about him before from time to time. Um This is the man who changed what it meant to be a villain on soap. Uh, especially in this country. Before Richard Hillman, villains sort of were rooted more in realism. Now, that wasn't always the case. There, there were sort of isolated examples. Um, but for the most part, your big villains, your people like, say, Nasty Nick and uh, Tommy Duckworth, they were, you know, Nasty Nick was was just a punk wasn't he? He he always reminds me of that sort of character in um like drug public service films, you know, the the sort of skeevy guy trying to sell drugs to kids. That's who Nasty Nick reminds me of. Um whereas Tommy Duckworth is just a guy who made a lot of really bad and easy decisions throughout his life and it just sort of got worse and worse from there. Both reasonable or not reasonable, but both realistic people. You you know, if you live in a certain areas you probably know people like that by the time we get to sort of around the time when Richard Hillman starting in 2001 I think um, you've had a few who sort of break the mould a bit um, EastEnders was leaning more into gangster stuff Coronation Street you've got uh, there was I can't remember her name there was like a nanny to the Platts who fell in love with Martin that was very sort of the hand that rocks the cradle E. um Anne Malone, who stalked Curly Watts and ended up freezing to death in the industrial freezer. These are not necessarily realistic characters. These are more like movie villains. Richard Hillman sort of treads the line between them. Um, you know, on on the one hand, he's he is more of a, a movie villain. I mean, he kills, like, what, three people? Um, but on the other hand... It's presented in such a way where it, it's it seems more realistic. Richard Hillman is not like a monster. He's a guy who who stumbles from one disaster to the next, all the while convincing himself that if he just does this one terrible thing, then everything will be okay. Um, that's who he is. He's not rejoicing in in all the murders he's committed. He's horrified by them. He doesn't kill Dougie. He he leaves him for dead and feels so guilty he feels he has to be the one to talk to Sunita about it. His ex-wife, he kills her out of anger. You know, he that's not a calculated malicious move or anything. Um and he's disgusted at himself when he kills Maxine. I mean that scene where he's delivering her eulogy after his father can't 
That is not a man rejoicing in his evil or even like coldly going through the motions. He looks like he is going to throw up. There's a lot more to Richard, and I think it helps that he's played by, you know, fairly Brian Kaplan, who's more famous for his role in Grange Hill at that point, as sort of a very genial teacher. Um, and the performance... I don't want to say it's a boring performance because it's not, but when he, he when he's introduced, you do sort of think, oh, okay, here's Gail's new boring boyfriend, um, who's not going to be much much interest to really anybody, um, and then it sort of escalates from there. But he he's just a guy who who makes an awful lot of mistakes and does the worst possible things to try and fix them. And I'm not like defending him. I'm not his solicitor. I'm just saying that. You know, this is not this is not a a, a satanic figure. Um, there is sort of more of a, a middle ground to Richard Hillman. There's there's he, in some ways he's very much like an old soap villain. In some ways he's very much like a new soap villain. You know, the producers have said that they were trying to do both, really. Um, I think towards the end he falls more into you know the new soap villain and I don't necessarily like aspects of that I think they lean into it too much but you know we all know it was a huge success um, just massive success it was everywhere when I was a kid um, it did bug me that they called him a serial killer because he wasn't a serial killer uh, but whatever that's just my personal little bugaboo um, but after that, I mean, we get big Richard Hillman type serial killers like once every year, um, it seems, in one soap or another, you know, Archie Mitchell or Pat Phelan or, you know, Grey from EastEnders or, you know, uh, Stephen Platt or whoever else, um, not Stephen Platt, Stephen, oh, I can't remember his surname because I'm bad at remembering things, but Gail's brother, um, you know, we get characters like that on a regular basis. That's because of Richard Hillman. Um, just easily one of the most important moments in, in British soap. Just changed what it meant to be a certain archetype. Could argue that was going to happen anyway. I think it definitely was. Um, but it would all have, always have been a Richard Hillman type figure who really cemented that change. Um, I don't necessarily think it would have happened in in... You know, little characters sort of gradually changing it. We were moving in that direction. Took a man like Richard Hillman to do it. Um, in terms of where he places, he he's he's. I mean, he is one of my favorite villains. Maybe maybe he is my favorite villain. I don't know. There's something to be said about just how how uh, recklessly evil a man like Archie Mitchell is. Um, you know, very much the antithesis of of Richard Hillman. But that's EastEnders, and we won't talk about that today. So, Rita. Now, I've spoken about Rita in regards to her relationship with Mavis and with Norris. Um, Rita on her own... I... Yeah, I I don't really have... I have fond feelings for Rita, but I'm not wild about her. She's... You sort of need characters like this in a soap. You sort of need the bedrock there. You need the um, you, know, you need people like Rita and Ken and you know whoever else who are who are also there and don't necessarily get massive storylines on a regular basis, um, but maybe get one or two. For Ken, it's it's you know the Mike Baldwin Deirdre affair. For Rita, it's Alan Bradley. Um, you know, I think maybe you could argue Alan Bradley. Is a is a better villain than than Richard Hillman, and she was right at the heart of that. Um, you know, when I was talking about realistic villains, Alan Bradley is sort of that early breaking of the mold. Um, but anyway, look, that if I ever do a video on Richard Hillman, I'll talk about it more than then. So, yeah, Rita. I don't think any does anybody dislike Rita. I don't think anybody dislikes Rita. I think just a very warm person very much the in her time the conscience well i suppose ken was the conscience she was more the heart sort of the warm she was the compassionate side of things um 
So yeah, I I honestly don't have a lot to say about Rita. Um, good evolution, I guess. You know, she was a, a sort of a showgirl. Now she's an old lady who's nice. <laughs> I guess I'm sorry. I know there's Rita fans out there. I'm fine with her. Um, you know, she's she's probably very much. Well, no. Well, I don't know. This is where this is where it gets hard. I'm gonna. I'm. I'm probably gonna put her there, but she's like right at the top of this, of this tier for me, really. Um, you know, if there was a C point five or whatever, she would be in there. Um, so now we've got Shelley. Now Shelley was, you know, in it for a little while. Um, she was a barmaid at the Rovers, and was probably most famous for her storylines involving uh, Charlie, which was a domestic abuse storyline. And um, oh, Peter Barlow. There we go. Didn't forget that name. Um, and the bigamy storyline. Shelley is, in a sense, very much like Raquel. Um, you know, she's one of those people who you do just want to look after. Um, she's sort of bubbly and and fun, but has a has a tough time with with men, to put it mildly. I guess I don't know. Um, I like the the stuff with with Charlie. Uh, I especially like the conclusion to that. I think that's that's really. That's a very empowering moment where she turns him down in front of everybody and then walks out. Um, that's great. The this scene with um, where Peter, you know, where his um, other wife, name not found, where uh, where she comes into the Rovers and um, you know tells her that they've married the same person. And she's down for revenge for a while, but then it gets a bit too bitter and she just sort of wants to move on and put it behind her, I think. Um, or even feel sorry for him. I can't quite remember how that fully pans out. I think he ends up... The other woman um, has a child by him and I think he wants to leave with her and then she turns him down and then they bugger off. And then that's how Simon Barlow comes into play. Anyway, um, yeah, Shelley is... Vulnerable, but she, uh, she, you know, warm, bubbly, sticks up for herself when needed. That's really the highlight of the, of the Charlie Stubb storyline for me with Shelley. Um, one of the things I mentioned before about soap is that choices are important when it comes to storylines and characters. Um, it's important that you choose the right characters so as to get the biggest impact out of things. Um, a good example probably is uh, the AIDS storyline in EastEnders. Um, you know, both Barbara Windsor and the. Uh, okay, it's a bad example because I can't remember the other guy's name. But both the key actors in it, um, Mark Fowler and uh, Barbara Windsor. They had had previous roles, so the public had a had a view of them in mind when they came into EastEnders. Um, the uh, Little Mo abuse storyline, again, perfect choice of characters uh, to strengthen the impact. So, you know, Shelley being warm and sort of bubbly and, and nice and sweet, it, it strengthens the impact more than it would if it was, you know, a, a tougher character. Um, well, kind of like Tracy Barlow, who intentionally, <laughs> intentionally plays up the abuse so as she, you know, to give her a, a solid cover when she eventually kills him, which is great. Frankly, I really like that storyline. Um, but yeah, Shelley, solid again. Like I've said before, Coronation Street repeats types. You know, it's another Raquel, but with a ever so slightly different spin on it. Um, yeah. I I like her. So I'm going to do these two together as well. We've got Roy and Haley Cropper. Now, uh, I mean, they are groundbreaking characters. Certainly, Haley is a groundbreaking character. But more than that, I just think they're really just likable characters, just good people. Um, I think I could. I mean, they're going in S tier. I've got to tell you now. <laughs> but one of the things that's key, or 
is um a recurring theme among the S tier is I could quite happily just watch them for hours. And uh, and Roy and Haley Cropper, I absolutely could. Um just two I mean it's presented as as two misfits, really. Two people who never really fit in and were on the peripheries, but are really decent people who found each other. Um I think just really likable people. That whole trans storyline is there are issues with it. Um, which I mean, I can do a whole video on that. Uh, I think there are. I think it was initially conceived as a joke. Um, Judy Hes Hesmonday, Hesmundi. I don't know. She has said that she believes that when it was mentioned in the writers' room, it was conceived as a joke. I think that's probably true. Um, and then they very quickly realised what they had and went in full in on it at some early stage. Um. But just two really, really likable, sweet, decent people. Um, I think Roy's evolution of the character in particular is really interesting. Like when he started, he's he's Deirdre's sort of creepy neighbor who, you know, is sort of overly keen to help in that way, and you sort of just wish he'd leave you alone. Um, he's not really done anything creepy, but he is a bit not even overbearing. He's just sort of there, um, and you do sort of you'd like to ask him to leave, but he hasn't really done anything to warrant it. Um, and then you know, he's, but he's smiley. He's he's sort of it's really interesting because he's he's a very different sort of character. He's smiley and he's making jokes and he's laughing and essentially he's just sort of. Just sort of, not even awkward, just sort of there and constant and, uh, you know, maybe a bit too friendly, but not in like an aggressive, overbearing way. Um, you know, annoying in that way that's sort of hard to pin down and, and quantify. Um, and then he meets Haley, and it's he gets a bit more awkward. And then as time goes on, they sort of... He seems obsessed with this idea that he's on the spectrum, and that seems to have popped in quite, you know, fair way into the character's span on the show. Um, well, early on enough, but, but, you know, it took a little while. And certainly it's only gotten more pronounced. Um, you know, it wasn't too long into his relationship with Hayley that he wasn't smiling at all, really. He was, you know, he didn't understand jokes that he might once have easily gotten or even made himself um i think he suffered a bit after after Haley's death they didn't really know what to do with him i think he was just sort of a a grieving widow and um you know that relationship that dynamic was so keen to both of those characters i think it's improved what with his his niece nina that was a great addition i think um and also um his relationship with Evelyn, that's another good addition. I think he's very much the character who needs somebody else to play off. Um, I don't think there's necessarily... I mean, there is enough there for him on his own, but it's not It's not nearly as strong. Um, and yeah, Hayley, Juicy Desmond Day, clearly very much someone who took her role on that show very, very seriously. She wanted to get it right. She knew how important it was. Um, and she does a great, great job. Um, just a really key character in soap history in so many ways. And in, in British history in general, quite frankly, British modern cultural history, certainly. Um, one of the, I really like their... Uh, there's a uh, plot where they're trying to um, foster a child. That pans through because they kidnap a kid, but they do it for the right reason, so it's okay. Uh, I I wish that had, I wish they'd done more with that. I wish they'd continued that. I wish we saw, you know, maybe them adopt. I would I would have so loved to see that. I think you know what sort of parents are these two people like? What sort of unique challenges does their child face? How do they? handle that that's all very interesting stuff that i think would have really been good to explore especially sort of later on when it, it doesn't necessarily feel like they've got 
all that much to do, even though they are, you know, I never watch them and I think, God, they're boring. It's it's more, they need something meaty, you know, to do in that sort of interim after the fostering phase sort of dies down. Um, but they do, oh, they are sort of parental, parental? Parental figures to, to a lot of um, people on the street, like Fizz and, and Sarah Louise and, and Chesney and whatnot. Um, it is a real shame they never had a child of the road. I think that would have been really interesting. I don't know why that wasn't pursued as an avenue in the writer's room. It's something I'd have to look into a bit more. Um, just just great characters. And, and I, I don't really like Haley's ending not necessarily on a like a uh writing level or a conceptual level or anything like that it's just it's just difficult to watch um but they didn't really have a choice because you know the actress wanted out and she wasn't going to you know those two characters it's so inconceivable to see them without each other by that point so if she had if she was going to move away, then Roy had to move away. Did you really want to lose both? Not particularly. You've kind of got to kill her off. But it's handled very touchingly, and very tenderly. And yeah, it's 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 really sweet. And it's it's very sad. And it is a testament to how loved that character was. That uh, there was quite a lot of outpouring of, of grief in the soap community. Um, yet another person Blanche was, was utterly vile about. There are quite a lot of jokes about at their expense, but uh, that again, if I ever make a video about them, and I sincerely hope I will, that's something I will go into more detail about. So, yes, as far as I'm concerned, easily top tier characters. I actually find Roy quite interesting. He's probably the sort of person I would spend time with. If I'm honest. Um, I know people joke that he's boring. I think he's. I think he's interesting. I would go to a lecture on the puddles mere martyrs. In a heartbeat with Roy Crocker. Um, but anyway, so now we've got. Uh, I'm not actually going to do Steve and Tracy together, even though they have been together, um, together very, very recently. But uh, we'll do them. We'll do them separately because I. I think while they have been together, they're not characters that necessarily you can't imagine with anybody else. Um, even though they do work really well together. Steve McDonald is... I only really have one thing to say about Steve McDonald, and it does the character a disservice, to be honest, because I know there's more to him than this. He's such a great... He's, he's just another great comedic character. That actor, God love him, has such a brilliant face for comedy, and I feel horrible saying that. I mean, it's such a rubbery, expressive face. Such a great hound dog face. The comedy, um, they get a good bit of mileage out of that. <laughs> it's just a fun, he's just like a a fun loser type character that I think is, you know, Steve McDonald at his best for me. Um, I know he's, you know, they've done more interesting stuff with the character. He certainly didn't start off like that. He was sort of a tearaway teen, him and his brother when they when they first joined. Um, since then they've done sort of different things with him. Um. But as far as I'm concerned, he's very much at his best for me when he's when he's funny. Um, and he's kind of hard to beat when he's like that. He's just one of those great comedic characters in the in the Cory cultural lexicon, not lexicon, but you know he, he is one of those great comedic characters. Um, there is more to him, uh, but you know there's more to a lot of comedic characters that's that's one force of him um it's something they lean into a lot i'm glad they've done other stuff i know he had a, a depression storyline recently he's had the stuff with karen he can do serious acting as well not just the funny stuff which he's great at um you know he can he can do the more serious and challenging um storylines and performances so yeah um honestly based I, this would probably change if I, you know, if if my um, experience of the character wasn't largely around the comedic stuff. Uh, if I knew a lot more about him, it might go down. But 
I'm going to put him right up here. Because uh, that stuff just really works for me. Um, yeah. um, so, uh, last up, Tracy Barlow. Now, I sort of have mixed views on Tracy Barlow. Um, and they're not necessarily fair, I think. I think Tracy Barlow is probably Coronation Street's best soap bitch. Um, I think far and away, I think one of the things a, a good soap bitch has to do is is lean into it. There is absolutely an element of pantomime, absolutely an element of camp to a soap bitch. Just over the top, excessive, um, you know, that sort of that sort of person, that sort of personality. Kim Tate, another great example. Um, Janine from EastEnders, another one. These are not subtle women. That being said, I, I again, this is one of those things, I don't know whether I'm in a minority on this as well. I don't think the actress is very good. I never have. Um, she's not the worst. There's just some some facet of her per, of her of her performance that just doesn't ring true for me and stands out. There's a a sort of blandness to the delivery. Maybe I don't know. It's one of those things that you can't necessarily describe, but you know it when it's there. Um, and it's kind of a shame because I like a lot of what she's she's doing the character i like the stuff with with charlie i like as awful and hateful as it is when she tricks roy cropper into thinking that he slept with her that's a that's an evil thing to have done um but it's one of those moments where she's you know you love to hate a character who does something like that it would be so much more impactful if the actress was like hate saying that i'm sure she's a lovely person I hope she's doing well. I'm sure she. I'm sure she's nice. I. I just doesn't work for me. Um, and I'm really. I'm really sorry about that. But it's one of those examples of having a hard time separating the actress or the actor from the character. The performance does mean a lot, and you do sometimes have to think: Is this the character I don't like? Is this the writing? Is this the performance? And in this case, I think it is the performance. Um, there, there are times when she's, when she's like, you know, there are a couple of scenes where she's interrupted the wedding and she's like being really over the top. That's when it stands out to me. When she's crying, it stands out to me. It's just, I'm sorry, Kate Ford. I really, <laughs> but it doesn't work for me. I'm sorry. Um, so. I'm I'm gonna have I'm gonna have to put her like I'm gonna put her here, and I know that seems really really harsh, um, but that's the thing about a character. It's not just one thing. It's not it's the writing. It's the performance. It's you know the other actors. This this actor is working around the other characters. This actor is working around. You know. Rita on her own is not as strong as Rita and Mavis. Um, you know, Roy and Hayley Cropper are nowhere near as strong alone. Certainly Stan and Hilda aren't either. Uh, but it's the performance as well. You know, a good performance can take a character. But there isn't necessarily a lot there. Um, and make them, you know, really, really far more than the sum of the parts. Just as a weaker performance can really hit a character and hinder a character. And sometimes it's very difficult to get over that performance. I'm afraid with Tracy Barlow, that is the case. Honestly, if, if the performance was a lot better, she, she'd be B or A easily. Um, but hey-ho. So, yeah. Um, yes, I hope you enjoyed this. I will be making another one of these. The next one won't be a Coronation Street one. It'll more likely than not be an EastEnders character tier list don't know when i'm doing it um probably in a few months or so i've got to do uh audio editing um for the next major video uh, and then i'm gonna make a start on the video editing it'll probably be part way through the video editing can't tell you when that is i haven't got a clue um so 
yeah, uh, I hope you enjoyed this. Please remember this is subjective. This is not an objective thing. This is purely my opinion. Um, it's fine if you disagree. It's completely fine. <laughs> I get it. I'm not so thin-skinned. I'm going to insist that you, you know, don't say I'm wrong about certain things. It's fine. I think Blanche is terrible. I will fight you on that hill if you love her. That's fine too. Um, you know, so, yeah. Um, bye.